Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the corticospinal tracts and the two divisions of it, which are the lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract. We're going to see that these are two neuron systems where they're comprised of upper motor neurons that originate in the brain, and then coming out of the spinal cord, we have lower motor neurons that are going to ultimately go to skeletal muscle and trigger their contraction. So let's get into the details here. So we have upper motor neurons that originate from the precentral gyrus in the cerebral cortex. So remember the precentral gyrus is that ridge of brain tissue that's directly anterior to the central sulcus. This is where we have motor parts of the brain. And specifically in the precentral gyrus, we're really talking about the motor cortex or primary motor cortex. And so you can see here in yellow, all these neurons right here, these are upper motor neurons. The circles here up at the top, these are the cell bodies of those upper motor neurons, and they originate up here at some location in that primary motor cortex of the precentral gyrus. Well, of course, they all have axons, and the axons descend downward from the motor cortex down through the cerebrum. They're ultimately going to pass through the thalamus, and then they're going to descend downward into the brainstem. Now remember, from superior to inferior, the brainstem has three components. We have a midbrain shown right here, a cross section, and then the pons, which is not shown, and then the most inferior part, another cross section here, is the medulla oblongata. And as these upper motor neurons descend through the midbrain, they're actually moving through the anterior part of the midbrain through a structure called the cerebral peduncles. And once they exit down through the midbrain, they'll move through the pons through a similar structure called the basis pontus. We'll actually see that on the next slide, take another view at it. And then once descending through the basis pontus of the pons, they then enter structures in the anterior medial part of the medulla called the pyramids. Okay? And these structures down here, these long vertical purple structures, these are the pyramids of the medulla oblongata. Now, when these upper motor neurons enter the pyramids, they're going to descend downward to some extent, and then a significant percentage of those nerve fibers are going to cross over to the other side of the medulla oblongata. This crossing over of these nerve fibers, or upper motor neurons, this is called decussation, or we would say that these upper motor neurons decussate to the other side of the medulla. And so at this decussation of pyramids, it's important to understand that only about 90% of these upper motor neurons belonging to the corticospinal tracts actually decussate to the contralateral side of the medulla. And you can see that represented here by more of these yellow upper motor neurons. And then 10% of these remain on the ipsilateral side of the medulla and continue down the same pyramid, ultimately down into the spinal cord. Okay. Now, above this decussation point, we just refer to these as the corticospinal tracts. Okay. But once the decussation occurs, the portion, which is 90% that cross over, these are now termed the lateral corticospinal tract because as they travel down uh, from the medulla through the spinal cord, they have a more lateral positioning in the spinal cord if we look at a cross section right here. Whereas the 10% that do not decussate and remain on the ipsilateral side of the medulla, when they enter the spinal cord, their position is more medial. And so they're referred to as the medial or anterior corticospinal tract. So first, let's talk about the lateral corticospinal tract. So after decussation, they're going to travel more down the lateral part of the spinal cord. And so this upper motor neuron here is going to synapse with this lower motor neuron cell body here in the anterior gray horn of the spinal cord. And then the axon of this lower motor neuron is going to exit that anterior gray horn, and it's going to move out of the spinal cord through the anterior or ventral root, and then it's going to move into the spinal nerve, and then one of the rami, either ventral or dorsal rami, and it's going to go to a skeletal muscle and cause it to contract. 
So when we look at upper motor neurons of the lateral corticospinal tract, they're synapsing with lower motor neurons that are controlling distal muscles in the extremities and limb muscles. So when we think about the muscles of the hand, intrinsic muscles of the hand, intrinsic muscles of the foot, um, even the muscles of the forearm and biceps and triceps, uh, those are muscles that are going to be controlled by the lateral corticospinal tract. And so the lateral corticospinal tract is more important for fractionated movements or fractionation, which is the ability to activate different muscles independently of one another. You can see this very nicely in somebody playing the piano. So obviously in playing the piano, different fingers on the same hand are going to have to move either in abduction or adduction, flexion, extension, independently of one another. And that's a good example of fractionated movement. And the muscles that are controlling those are either intrinsic muscles of the hand and or the forearm musculature. Okay. So lateral corticospinal tract controls muscles of the distal extremities in the limb and mainly responsible for fractionated movement. The other important thing about the lateral corticospinal tract is that after this decussation right here to the contralateral side of the spinal cord, it's then going to control a lower motor neuron here on that side of the spinal cord. So notice this lower motor neuron is destined for a skeletal muscle on the right side of the body because we're looking at an anterior view. But those upper motor neurons are originated from the left hemisphere of the brain. So, when we're talking about the lateral corticospinal tract, we always think of contralateral control of skeletal muscles. And to understand that, just follow the path of these neurons. These upper motor neurons originate in the left hemisphere of the motor cortex, and when they go down, they decussate to the contralateral side and control lower motor neuron on that side. So, this tract controls contralateral musculature. Then that leaves the other 10% of these upper motor neurons that do not decussate to the other side of the spinal cord. These are going to be the anterior or medial corticospinal tracts. And so the anterior corticospinal tract descends ipsilaterally down the spinal cord, meaning it's descending down the same side of the spinal cord as it originated from the motor cortex of the brain. Now there's one thing here at the bottom of the picture that I want to make perfectly clear and we'll actually clear it up more on the next slide too. This upper motor neuron of the anterior corticospinal tract is descending down from the left hemisphere of the brain and it's descending down the left half of the spinal cord. But then it appears to synapse with a lower motor neuron on the right side of the spinal cord so it would be going out to musculature on the right side of the body. That's a half-truth or a partial truth. The full truth is that if we look at these upper motor neurons in the anterior corticospinal tracts, on one side, they will actually synapse with lower motor neurons on the ipsilateral side not shown here, and the contralateral side shown over here. So in other words, if we're looking at upper motor neurons of the anterior corticospinal tract that are coming down the left side of the spinal cord, they will synapse with lower motor neurons also on the left side that go to the left skeletal muscles and lower motor neurons on the right side that go to right skeletal muscles. In other words, any muscle that's innervated through the anterior corticospinal tract has bilateral innervation and that will come to play something important clinically at the very end of this video. Now, the upper motor neurons of the anterior corticospinal tract are going to synapse with lower motor neurons that tend to innervate muscles in the neck, the shoulder girdle, uh, the hip girdle, and the trunk. So pretty much proximal muscles and postural muscles. So if we think of the erector spiny, the abdominal muscles, the shoulder girdle muscles, the hip girdle muscles. These are going to be muscles that are innervated by lower motor neurons that are controlled through the anterior corticospinal tract. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's take a look at one other view of this. So a little bit less detail. Maybe this will help you better. So up here at the level of the cortex in the precentral gyrus or primary motor cortex, we have the cell bodies of these upper motor neurons. Okay. And their axons are going to descend downward. Okay, those upper motor neurons are going to go through the thalamus. They're going to descend through the midbrain, through the cerebral peduncles. They're then going to descend through the pons, through the basis pontus, right? And they're then going to enter into the medulla oblongata, okay? Remember, right here, we're going to have that decussation of pyramids. So 
about 90% of those upper motor neurons are going to decussate to the other side. And these become the lateral corticospinal tract. Okay? The 10% that do not decussate and stay on the ipsilateral side, these are the medial or anterior corticospinal tracts. And remember, the anterior corticospinal tracts control more postural muscles and proximal muscles. So the back, the abdomen, the hip and shoulder girdles, whereas the lateral corticospinal tract is going to control more of the distal muscles in both extremities, the lower and upper, and muscles of the hands and feet. So fractionated movement rather than posture. Another important thing here is that the upper motor neurons of the lateral corticospinal tract ultimately have control of contralateral skeletal muscles. So in this picture, we're looking at an anterior view again. So this would be the right hemisphere of the motor cortex. So these cell bodies on the right half of the brain are controlling skeletal muscle on the left half of the body, assuming we're talking about the lateral corticospinal tract, so contralateral control. Whereas the anterior corticospinal tract, notice that these upper motor neurons synapse with lower motor neurons that ultimately control muscles on both sides of the body. So the anterior corticospinal tract is going to exert bilateral control. This also has important implications for stroke. So if we consider here a stroke of the right side of the brain, so the right motor cortex, what deficits would we expect to see and to what extents would those deficits occur? Well, if you have a right-sided stroke of the brain, you would probably be tempted to say that the left side, the left skeletal muscles, are going to be negatively affected. And that's true. The left side is going to be negatively affected. But the distal extremities are going to be affected a lot more. So the intrinsic muscles of the hand, the forearms, biceps and triceps, right? The distal muscles on the left side. And why are they going to be more affected? Well, if you have these muscles on the left side, the distal muscles, their only control is through the right side of the brain, right? They have no control through the left to compensate. So their only means of activation and control is on the right side, and the right side is damaged. So if the right side of the motor cortex is damaged, then those muscles are going to strongly lose their ability to contract, they're going to be very, very weak, and they're going to take longer to recover. But what about more postural muscles? Like, let's take, for example, uh, the obliques, the abdomen, those muscles. Well, those muscles have bilateral control. Remember, those muscles are more postural, so they're controlled by upper motor neurons of the anterior corticospinal tract. And so they have control from both the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. So if we have a right stroke, we're going to see some deficits in those postural muscles, but not as much as we will see in the distal extremities. And again, that's because those postural muscles have bilateral control. We'll see some deficits, but there's still that other half of the brain that's not affected, presumably, uh, that still exerts some control over those postural muscles, and so they won't be affected as much. The distal extremity muscles will be a lot more affected because their only means of activation and control has been damaged. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the corticospinal pathway and why it's important and what the implications of it are in a stroke. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.